We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to a special episode of Atheist Nomads. We are breaking with the normal schedule. This is coming out on Tuesday instead of the normal Thursday, and some of the normal episode that would have been out this week will still be coming out on Thursday. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hello, everybody. And we are joined by Connor Robinson, the program director for the Humanist Service Corps, serving in Ghana. Shit. (laughs) Hey, everyone. Thank you. (laughs) This is the first time we're talking to somebody who is not in Britain, Australia, or the U.S. All places with reliable high-speed internet. (laughs) This is true. Very true. I'm actually I'm actually surprised that this is coming through okay at the moment. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So we are, and it's also uh, twelve fifty your time, so after yeah, midnight. So, so we we're, sorry we're, about that. We won't waste your time. No worries, no worries. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. All right. So could you give us a to start off a a brief synopsis of what the Humanist Service Corps is and what you're doing uh, there in Ghana? Yeah, I can try. Um, although it's a, it's a rather large uh, project. So the Humanist Service Corps is the first and right now the only international volunteering program guided by the values of humanism. And that is to say it's right now the only volunteering program that is explicitly intended to provide uh, a service opportunity for the non-religious. Okay. And so that's, you know, the, the thrust of it. Um, but the way we go about doing things is also, we think, um, pretty important too. So it's intended to be culturally responsible volunteering that supports existing grassroots movements. And so uh, the first one we picked is a women's rights organization in the northern region of Ghana. And that's why I'm talking to you at, you know, nearing 1 a.m. because I'm over in Ghana with the first team of Humanist Service Corps volunteers supporting that Ghanaian women's rights organization. And is this a long-term uh project or is this a short-term trip no it's definitely long term that's part of uh that's part of what we think culturally responsible service means so this first Good. uh team and subsequent teams uh for the foreseeable future future will, will all be year-long commitments but um our sort of umbrella commitment as a, as an organization to this women's rights group in northern ghana is for the you know foreseeable future probably at least a decade if not more oh that's, that's pretty nice. badass and uh your your uh, humanist service corps actually ties into foundation beyond belief right exactly yeah we're not a separate nonprofit. we are a program of foundation beyond belief okay very nice um so tell us about the project that you're you're working on what are you doing in ghana <laughs> So at the moment, um, we have a couple, well, we actually have several different projects, but there are two that really bear mentioning um, above all the others. Right now we've got a, I don't really know how else to put it, except to say that it is just an undeniably, unmistakably, straightforwardly awesome medical project in a camp for alleged witches. I kid you not, this is a refugee uh, sanctuary type place for women who have been banished for fear of their lives after being accused of witchcraft. Oh, wow. And yeah, this, this stuff still happens and it happens a lot. Um, and so this project that we have going on uh, for for this uh, camp for alleged witches, um, <clears throat> really we think exemplifies everything I was saying about uh, culturally responsible service. Uh, we came in, we uh, gathered information from the locals and from uh, the partner organization we were supporting, and then in conversation with them and with the local government, we devised a project whereby we're providing. Uh, free healthcare screenings for an entire community, more than 1,200 people. 
And then wow. in the process of collecting that information from the screenings, we are um, recording the information in both English and Dagbanli, the local language, and in such a way that we're correcting a glitch in the existing uh, Ghana medical record system. So in basically every way you can imagine, we're dramatically increasing healthcare access for this community. Mm -hmm. And the um, that that has additional implications when we look closer at this uh, this witchcraft issue, because if you think about it, and if you you look at the the conditions in Ghana, you see that you know these these witchcraft accusations are only occurring in the places where where there's the least access to healthcare and education and jobs basically. And so this project that we're, we're doing is educating people about what the health concerns are. It's giving them access to healthcare and it's even employing some of them. And so, you know, it's, it's just, it's trying to get at all of the uh, factors uh, for, for a happy, healthy life while also undermining the circumstances that lead to these witchcraft accusations in the first place. Mm. Now, before the show, you're saying that this uh, was brought to your attention a lot by uh, Leo Igwe. Yeah, yeah. Um, Leo is really the reason that that we are here. Uh, he's directly responsible. Uh, when I um, before the Humanist Service Corps existed, I set out on a uh, year long um, research trip called Pathfinders Project, and the purpose of that trip was to visit a short list of potential partner organizations uh, in order to pick the one that would be the best partner for the launch of the Humanist Service Corps. And uh, it was through Leo Igwe that we were connected to Songtaba, our partner organization in the northern region of Ghana. And really it was, you know, from just reading Leo's work and talking with him about the circumstances surrounding witchcraft accusations in, in Western Africa that uh, we became convinced that this was the, the work that we needed to be engaged in. Very nice. And, you know, the, the healthcare aspect, especially, uh, I, I'm, most of us here in, in the Western world, we don't appreciate what a refugee camp is like. Right. So my understanding there is it, very common for, well, A, health, basic life needs not being met and healthcare not being present, but they're great breeding grounds for disease. We're in an area of the, you know, the country and well, um, the continent, uh, but specifically I'll talk about Ghana. We're going to be, we're working in an area where malaria risk is high in particular, mm. and there are many other diseases, but just to highlight malaria, um, we, it, we've only conducted about a third of our medical screening so far. Uh, well, I say only, but we're actually ahead of schedule, which is great. But we've already identified uh, in that, you know, 300 to 400 number of screenings, about 10% of the population having malaria. And, you know, these are people who would not have had the disease identified if this outreach wasn't happening and therefore they wouldn't have gone to seek treatment or if they would have, it would have been uh, much delayed and early identification of malaria saves lives. Mm -hmm. um, Malaria is one that, that the people even understand better than others, but it's also one that leads directly to witchcraft accusations because um, dreams are considered evidence for uh, for or proof that that a witch is visiting you to do you harm, and of course malaria causes fever, and then the fever causes fever dreams. So you can follow that chain of logic to its conclusion. Wow! <clears throat> Holy crap! <laughs> That, yeah, that's that, not yeah. Nice. Other 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 health conditions are are not good. You know, there's a lot of malnutrition. Um, a lot of uh, you know, hygiene can be can be very poor. Um, there's definitely uh, there's definitely a lot of development to be done in uh, these rural areas, especially ones where, I mean, they're 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 banishing people there for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, so these these areas do need support. Wow, and you're not just dealing with with the the, the medical needs. What are some of the other stuff you're you're working on? Sure. So, um, 
We've we've looked at clean water projects with uh, this particular community uh, where we're doing the medical records project. But in that, we're supporting uh, our our main goal is to support an existing organization. We're supporting all of their programs, and the gender based uh, discrimination of witch hunting is only one of the forms of gender based discrimination that our partner organization addresses through its programs. So we're also supporting education programs in the broader community. Uh, there's one called Complementary Basic Education that uh, aims to provide uh, remedial classes to young women who have fallen out of the schooling system for any number of reasons so that they uh, have the numeracy and literacy skills to get back into the classroom. Um, there are other programs that our partner runs related to supporting women entrepreneurs. Uh, for example, they support uh, more than 100 groups of women smallholder farmers. Smallholder is a British English word, so I don't know if that translates on this podcast, but uh, it just it just means you know, like basically people who are farming in their backyards, no more than okay. an acre, no, no more than an acre. Um, but yeah, so you, I mean, you can see it's it's all about uh, women's empowerment, and another aspect of that is just helping people advocate for themselves. So some of what we do is also just trying to build up the the platform that these these women and and uh, young people have to advocate for women's rights. Uh, you know, for example, um, we've been helping out a lot with communications on social media. We are trying to help the partner organization revamp its website, stuff like that. You know, a lot of what we do is behind the scenes because we don't want to take the attention of the partner organization because that would actually, in our opinion, not be culturally responsible service. The face mm -hmm. of change should be a local face. Definitely. Uh, so how is this all, all paid for? Well, um, <laughs> right now it's not fully paid for. We're, uh, we're operating um, sort of day to day with things like the, the medical project in Kukuo, which is the name of that uh, camp for alleged witches. Um, to, to put it, you know, very uh, straightforwardly, Foundation Beyond Belief as the parent organization is making an investment in what they think will be a program that eventually um, feels like it belongs to the entire free thought atheist humanist community. But um, there, there's going to come a time uh, soon, well, maybe it's already here, I hope, that um, we, we begin uh, seeing more and more of the movement, more and more of that community uh, step up to support the Humanist Service Corps. Because, I mean, if you look at the, the health screenings project that we're doing, for example, uh, because we have volunteers in place, after that initial investment in the volunteer, the, the cost of carrying out the project is actually very small. We're only asking for $5,000 to do more than 1,000 screenings and to completely revamp an entire medical record system. I mean, I think that's, that's, a, huge, uh, that's a huge impact with only $5,000. Yeah. That's what I've always but understood, then, is that right? just getting people over there is the difficult part. Exactly. Yeah. But once you, then you have people on the ground who can create the relationships and invest the time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then then you you're in position to do more efficient uh, service and to spend donor money more effectively. Now, of course, donors can say, but, you know, what about that initial investment? Why am I paying for someone to volunteer? And, you know, that that is a good question. And I, I do think people should look at that at carefully. But then when you if you're going to look at that carefully, I also want people to look at this uh, this medical project, for example, which, as I mentioned before, I just think is straightforwardly awesome. And um, that's the kind of thing we need people to get behind. Uh, if even if they don't, uh, if they're not jazzed about supporting, you know, a volunteer going abroad, we're also setting people up to support only that volunteer's work, like this medical records project in Kukuo. Leo, and I work in, in medical IT. I know that uh, revamping medical record systems is a royal pain in the ass. <laughs> Being able to pull that off well, with five grand, that's amazing. Well, <laughs> maybe I, I could paint you a picture, though, of what's what's <laughs> going on here. I feel like you'll have an appreciation for it. I'm guessing when I paper. say When I say... 
Yes, <laughs> it's it's paper, but I mean, it's not even in filing cabinets paper. We're talking okay. about just record books in stacks. I don't know how. I mean, I don't know how they find this stuff, but to to you know flip that in reverse i know exactly why all of these patients are having their records lost and why they're ending uh-huh. up with duplicate upon duplicate uh medical records and so our our project is actually sort of creating a bridge uh, that allows for people's records to be combined and then for whatever reason the original system um, indexes everything by a number that's on a card that, of course, you know everyone loses, but then they don't have it cross-referenced with the name. So then, <laughs> so our system is keeping record of um, everybody's numbers, pre-existing or newly created, and then we're we're organizing them by their names alphabetically, so that everyone can reaccess their information if they so choose. Yes, because that's really important. <laughs> yeah, like tracking your tracking your healthcare is important. Yes, yes. You you don't want to have to start over fresh every single time you see the doctor. Right. And then of course they also oh. charge for them to start over fresh every single time. So and that oh. in Ghana is a major limitation for most people. So <laughs> Wait, and so they're they're charging for the health services at this refugee camp for people who've been driven from their homes. Right. So in this particular camp, um, there, there, I mean, there's a long history here. A, a true community has sprung up from the offspring of these alleged witches, because what happens when these women are banished, because it's almost exclusively elderly women, is that they're sent with caretakers. And so, of course, this is another human rights violation, because then you're not just banishing this elderly woman who can't take for, take care of herself, but then also because this elderly woman can't take care of herself, you are taking a child away from her family and her, for her education and her mm. community, right? But then, so what's happened over the years is that all of these caretakers have settled with the people that they are taking care of. And then, you know, they've met, they met the other caretakers, you know, and they, they ended up getting married. They're having families. So a full community has sprung up to the point that, you know, we're, we're at a, a population of above 1,200 people or so. Wow. And so that's large enough that there, this community has a chief, it has elders, it has a, what's considered a Royal family. And it even has a compound where there are some medical staff, but these medical staff don't do, um, well, they, they don't do much outreach into the community, uh, except for periodic vaccination exercises. So there's no, there isn't a concept of sort of routine preventative medicine. And that's the sort of thing that we'd like to see adopted Mm -hmm. after, after people have a better understanding of their health history. Yeah. And doing screening is the start of that. So kudos. Thank you. Holy crap. So they've basically created a tribe of, of of victims of of human rights violations yeah yeah i mean you you do see that uh the population of this camp actually comes from uh several different uh, existing tribes and, and communities in the area and they are united by by that alone they they are the victims of human rights abuse my goodness <laughs> yeah <laughs> are there are there other camps like this or Yeah, so um, there are five camps like this in the northern region. And um, the interesting thing to note is that uh, the northern region is the only region in Ghana where these camps exist. And in fact, it's it seems to be the only place in um, West Africa where these where these camps exist. And although many people um, many people want to see these places shut down, they see the camps as the problem. Uh, 
our partner organization and, and many other experts here feel that it's actually more just a symptom, right? The problem mm -hmm. is the accusations themselves. And when we look at other regions of Ghana and we look at other countries uh, in the, the larger region of Central West Africa, we see that uh, alleged witches are much more often just killed by mobs, whereas in this area, they are at least permitted to escape to these to these communities these camps so there's a silver lining there i guess when you say <laughs> that these women are living in you know utterly deplorable conditions but they have their lives um, and but that's why it's been such a, a difficult thing getting these camps shut down as the guinean government wants to do because their original communities aren't safe for them to return to so how are you just gonna shut them down no, when when you talk about witches and and Africa, the first thing I, that always comes to my mind is Helen Ukpabio, and you know uh -huh. I, I know she is from Nigeria, but um, she, I know she has a, a wide influence. Uh, is is any of that being felt up there, or what's going on? Well, I, I'm not um, clear enough on the connections to comments if, on if there's anything direct going on, but I can certainly see a lot of similarities. I mean, there's um, one, of, one of the most powerful uh, churches in Ghana is, is called the Mount Horeb uh, Prayer Center. And I think Horeb is another name for Sinai. So, um, you know, biblical references abound in southern Ghana where the the population is predominantly Christian but so at this um, at this prayer center there are decades of documented human rights abuses against uh, people with mental illness people who are accused of witchcraft uh, people who just aren't wanted by their family I mean these people are chained to beds or trees and then the treatment there the quote-unquote treatment they are given is prayer uh, and exorcism and so uh, this is in southern Ghana um, but this reminds me a lot of what I've read about with um, with Helen Ukpabio uh, where you know you have a yeah the witch children exactly because in the south you will actually see the children rather than just elderly women being accused of witchcraft um, but you, where you have someone who's a charismatic figure from a very powerful church bringing in millions of dollars um, and where that money is being spent on torture, torture. I mean, they call these places prayer camps, but they're, they're places where torture is occurring. And the, the crazy thing is that... The president of Ghana, for example, uh, is a is a big fan of the Mount Horeb pr uh, prayer center, which is right. just mind boggling to me. People know this is happening. People know this is happening. People in power know this is happening. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the downer. <laughs> no, this is stuff that needs to get out to people. Is is there any hope to address this, the, the actual root cause, to, to get this, these witchcraft accusations to stop? Well, I think so. Um, I mean, maybe, maybe I just, I have to have hope, right? Maybe we all have to have hope in order to, uh, to keep plugging away. Um, but I, I think there's a way forward. And I, I really think that there's a clear connection that can be, done, be drawn between increased access to education, healthcare, and jobs, and then a decrease in people, A, having too many tragedies that they have to explain on stuff they don't understand, you know, with exp with bad explanations, basically, and B, an increase in people's abilities to explain better, right? So mm -hmm. they don't have to rely on witchcraft as an explanation, and they have fewer things to, you know, to try to explain away anyway. So I think that's really the way forward. And if you look at Ghana, even though more than 90% of the population believes in witchcraft. It, in most of the country, this sort of thing doesn't happen. You don't have the witch hunting. You don't have the mob violence. You, you might have people, you know, 
calling or making these wild accusations, but nothing ends up happening after those accusations, like that, like it ha happens in the northern region. So for me, the analogy, and I this might not be considered a fair analogy, but it's good for us to remember that I think in the U.S. it's good for us to remember we're not all that far removed from our own witch hunting, right? Yeah. Um, and so the analogy that I like to come up with is not about our own hitch, witch hunting, but it's about Americans' belief in ghosts and angels, right? So we know that even many atheists, em embarrassment though that may be to some of us, believe in ghosts and angels, right? And we know that a large majority of the country believes in these things, especially if we're talking about angels. Now, do I like that? Not really. Do I think that everyone should try to live as reasonably and rationally as possible? Yes. But in the grand scheme of things, I don't think a person's belief in angels is changing them all that much or their behavior all that much. And where I see most Ghanaians who do believe in witchcraft, they kind of treat it like the angel thing. And I think that that is at least our first step in Ghana is if we can just get people to the point where sure they still believe in it but they don't use the belief for anything and it doesn't change their behavior then that's a first step and then after that we can go from there but i do think it's possible to get to that step okay but it, it'll probably happen similar to you know how it did in, in u.s history where it just kind of naturally falls out of out of favor yeah yeah, exactly. I mean, I don't think this is something that um, that you can wage war on. You know, you, you can't you can't combat superstition or you'll entrench people um, by yeah. by calling them stupid, you know, yeah, or saying, oh, this down. is so silly. Right. So, yeah, it's it is something that we have to allow and well, not allow. It's something we have to encourage to die down and sort of just fade away by replacing it with better explanations and better, you know, better standards of living. All right, oh, man, man, <laughs> that this is intense. Yeah. So, Connor, what come, can... to, come to Ghana. <laughs> so, Connor, what can people do to help? Well, I did already mention the um, health screenings fundraiser that we're working on. If, uh, if people are more interested in directly supporting our partner organization, which is something we also encourage, our, we've recently got our partner organization set up on Global Giving, which is a, a major uh, philanthropic giving platform. And they're currently raising money precisely for this uh this reintegration issue. So um, trying to advocate for women accused of witchcraft and trying to create a safe path for them to return home by decreasing the odds of future accusations occurring in these rural communities. And um, that fundraiser on global giving for our partner organization, Song Taba, is a challenge fundraiser. And that means that if uh, $5,000 is raised by 40 unique donors, then our tiny northern region of Ghana partner organization will be established as a permanent uh, grant receiving organization on global giving. This would be a major, major coup, not just for uh, Song Taba, our partner organization, and not just for the Humanist Service Corps in helping our partner organization, but in ending this issue, this entrenched uh, long-standing issue of accusing women, elderly women of witchcraft and banishing them if they get banished and not, you know, beaten severely or killed. So I really want to encourage people to go that way if they're interested in supporting. But then, of course, as I mentioned before, this is also advocacy work. So if anyone is is unable to give money but can donate time and just in terms of liking or sharing or talking, you know, raising awareness among their Facebook friends or even in, you know, in person about, hey, did you know this still happens? Um, even if people just get involved in that way. Our audience is so important to the work we're doing in raising awareness about this, that that is also hugely impactful. And we, we appreciate every single share in that way. 
Okay, so I guess for our listeners who didn't uh, support the new equipment upgrades, um, and you know who you are, um, <laughs> give now. <laughs> and I, I will have a link to that in the show notes for sure. Yeah, and if um, if any of that's tough to find, uh, all of it can be found at humanistservicecore.org, or the Facebook page is also pretty easy. It's facebook.com slash humanists in action. I didn't think that through fully when I wrote it, because if you read it quickly, it sounds like humanist in action, you know, non-activity. <laughs> but uh, our hopefully care people humanism. know what I meant. <laughs> yeah. It's the opposite, hopefully. Um and then we're also at uh, twitter.com slash humanist service. So uh, you, people can find us, uh, and uh, we hope they do. Uh, like, share, tweet, refollow, all that stuff. <clears throat> all right. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to, to talk to us and for staying up late. Thank you very much for having me. I sincerely appreciate it. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads. And like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash atheistnomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. Theme music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been the Atheist Nomads. Atheist Nomads.